Matthew Meehan is a director of academic programs and the Worsham Teaching Fellow at Hillsdale College's Kirby Center in Washington, DC. He earned his PhD at the University of Dallas, where he wrote a dissertation on Shakespeare's vision for leadership education in his collaborative play, Sir Thomas More. Dr. Meehan has been a Publius Fellow at the Claremont Institute and is a Fellow of the Center for Thomas More Studies and a reader at the Fulger Library. He has served as a speechwriter and communications consultant for civic leaders around the country. He is the author of Mr. Meehan's Mildly Amusing Mythical Mammals, an illustrated book of poems. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Matthew Meehan. Thank you very much, Applied Mathematics. It's awesome, I hear it's a lit talk. I guess Matt Bell has a sense of humor. I'm gonna pair us together, but that's good. That's the liberal arts. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Matt Bell, for shepherding me out here. Um, and thank you all for your support of Hillsdale, uh, particularly our new venture, which I've been a part of out in uh, Washington, D.C., the Steve and Amy Van Andel Graduate School of Government. I got the unbelievable honor to teach the very first classes, very first classes, very first class uh, this fall. And it was just wonderful. We started with Antigone um, and the Book of Proverbs uh, and Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Um, and it's happening right on Capitol Hill and it's, it's been a really great honor in my life. So thank you all for supporting Hillsdale. <clears throat> Before I speak directly about Thomas More's utopia, uh, I'd like to start with three jokes about Marxist socialists, but I repeat myself. <laughs> From the satirical humor site McSweeney's, usually left-leaning, but nevertheless, uh, see if you can spot what all three of the jokes have in common. The first one, knock, knock, who's there? A Marxist socialist. A Marxist socialist who? A Marxist socialist who wants to give you a pamphlet about class struggle. I'll try another one, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> what did one Marxist socialist say to another? Like you, I also advocate a proletarian revolution culminating in collective ownership. Last one, bear with me. What do you get when you cross a Marxist with a socialist? Two people who generally feel that the value of a commodity is equal to its socially necessary labor time. They're great fun at parties. I think that's the takeaway here. <clears throat> what the humorist at McSweeney's is getting at is that the famous German socialist is what the famous German socialist Friedrich Engels knew was a distinct trait of German socialists, where all of this sort of began. In the introduction to his English edition of socialism, utopian and scientific, and there he's borrowing from the word coined by Thomas More there, which is a collected series of, shocker, pamphlets. Uh, by the way, uh, they're great fun at parties. They give you pamphlets. Poor Friedrich seems defensive before his witty English audience when he writes this. As is well known, we Germans are of a terribly ponderous Grundlichkeit. Okay, radical profundity or profound radicality, whatever you may like to call it. When you learn that Grundlichkeit uh, basically means thoroughness, that's all it means, right? The next line becomes unintentionally hilarious. Engels continues to expound thoroughly on the meaning of thoroughness this way. Whenever any one of us expounds what he considers a new doctrine, he has first to elaborate it into an all-compromising system. He has to prove that both the principles of logic and the fundamental laws of the universe had existed from all eternity for no other purpose than to ultimately lead to this newly discovered crowning theory. And it gets even more ridiculous after that when this Vater of modern German socialism, we find out was trying to satirize another socialist. And after going through another page of this, he says finally, uh, with a little Grundlichkeit of his own, anyhow, 
the systematic comprehensiveness of my opponent gave me the opportunity of developing in opposition to him and in a more connected form than had previously been done the views held by Karl Marx and myself on this great variety of subjects. Like I said, Thanksgiving dinner just isn't the same without Uncle Friedrich arguing with good old cousin Mr. Professor Dr. E. During. This is how they speak. They speak heavy, ponderous monologues, massive systems. It's not a witty group. In short, German socialists are not known for their wit, and Friedrich Engels knew it well enough to be sheepish about it before the witty British audience he was seeking to persuade in that essay. Without arguing it here, permit me to assert that a people tend to be witty if they've been led so by the witty examples of their famous writers, speakers, their poets, historians, and statesmen. And if they're very fortunate, even their philosophers. Not incidental to our purpose today, Thomas More was all of these things. But let me uh, be more thorough and give you the testimony of one of More's own contemporaries. Thomas More is a man of an angel's wit and singular learning. He is a man of many excellent virtues. I know not his fellow, for where is the man in whom is so many goodly virtues of that gentleness, lowliness, and affability, and as time requires, a man of marvelous mirth and pastimes and sometimes of steadfast gravity, a man for all seasons. Those were the words of Robert Whittington, who was a liberal arts teacher and translator of Cicero and Seneca, two Roman philosopher statesman orators deeply favored by Thomas More and featured in More's most famous and famously misunderstood utopia. The phrase, man for all seasons, suits More well, so well that it became the hallmark of the 20th century understanding of him. In his lifetime, More was Speaker of the House of Commons, and while he was Speaker of the House of Commons, he secured the first um, right of free speech, not for the whole of London or the whole of England, but just for the parliament, so they could speak freely to the king without at risking their lives. Um, he was also the Lord Chancellor of England, stepping up, as Shakespeare put it, up nearly to his country's head, right below the king, essentially effectively running the government for him. Uh, and he was a famous poet, historian, and essayist, as well as a brilliant lawyer and an attentive father. And after his execution and death, Moore was praised before Queen Elizabeth, that's Henry VIII's father, who he, whom he opposed, and the entire parliament at St. Paul's Cathedral in Shakespeare's time, and named a saint of both the Anglican and Catholic churches in our own time. That to me is the sort of the great combo trick. Like, I don't know how you do that, the Church of England and uh, the Roman Church. But anyway, uh, all of these impressive achievements of, of more aside, in 1954, the playwright Robert Bolt wrote A Man for All Seasons about Moore's artful and courageous resistance to King Henry VIII, who violated the Magna Carta and his coronation oath in order to divorce his wife and declare himself the head of both church and state. Moore's refusal to accept this Caesaropapism of King Henry landed Moore in the Tower of London and then on the chopping block. Likewise, it is that same stalwart objection by Moore to the combination of state and church authority that sent the Puritan pilgrims to Plymouth and the Catholic pilgrims to Maryland. The film version of Man for All Seasons won eight Academy Awards in 1967, including Best Picture and Director. And in 1990, the Law Society of Great Britain named him Lawyer of the Millennium. And Pope John Paul II named him the patron of statesmen for the Catholic Church worldwide. Despite all these various accolades and honors over the centuries, despite being a principal source of a number of Shakespeare's plays, despite being considered by Jonathan Swift to be, quote, the person of the greatest virtue these islands ever produced, it is nevertheless true what Robert Bolt's Moore's character says to a simple-minded Spaniard diplomat when he presumes to know what Moore thinks about the politics of the day. The Spaniard, but your views, Sir Thomas More, are well known. Which More contradicts saying, my views are much guessed at. So too today, with careless, unhistorical, and confusing melodramas like HBO's The Tudors and BBC's Wolf Hall, More's view remains much guessed at, but still very poorly known. And that's especially true when it comes to his most complex 
and confounding ironic work, Utopia, written in 1516, published throughout the continent and England and wildly popular from the start. I mean, it was the book of Europe at the time. Sort of, we have Hunger Games, they had Utopia, sort of different world. <laughs> yeah. Moore makes himself a character in the dialogue of Utopia, along with his friend and fellow Christian humanist, Peter Giles. But it's a tricky dialogue uh, that has within it both a monologue about a different dialogue from before the dialogue and a different monologue within the dialogue that's longer than the rest of the entire dialogue, except that the monologue is technically a very long part of the dialogue. <laughs> that's a little Grundlichkeit for you. <laughs> the two major monologues in Utopia are given by the third interlocutor in the dialogue, a strange and passionate character. He's a traveler and scholar named Raphael Hifloday, who claims to have lived on the amazing island of Utopia, which means no place, by the way, and with its novel and, he says, truly excellent political institutions. The text of Utopia is divided into two books, and Raphael Hifloday dominates both of them. Book two of Utopia is almost exclusively Raphael's long and extremely thorough account of the laws, habits, and customs of the Utopians. And even though book two technically has Moore's character speak at the very end, it is really Raphael Hithliday's monologue, with the other speakers reduced to mere onlookers. Hithliday frustrates any authentic dialogue at that point. And I'm kind of reminded of the bad guy syndrome from The Incredibles, you remember that line? You sly dog, you caught me monologuing, right? The bad guys in the comic books are always monologuing about their evil plans. Uh, there's something about that in Raphael Hithlida. He just gets going and you, you can't stop him. This chronic monologuer's name means both healer of God, that's Raphael, Raphael, and skilled speaker of nonsense, Hithlodeus in Greek. By giving the character a name like that, Moore sets the attentive reader on guard to suspect that whatever Raphael Hithliday is going to say about this island and its institutions, utopia, you can bet it's going to be a mixture of sense and nonsense. And so it is. But you'd need to have the wit to see that Moore is not being ponderous, literal, and radical, but rather witty, ironic, and subtle. To understand Moore's utopia properly. The habit of socialist, Marxist, communist, Grundlichkeit, but again I repeat myself, is not very helpful because that cast of mind and cast of character only stifles the wit required to see well the practical, political, and actual world in which we live and work. Now I want to take a moment to apologize for this talk because it combines a few things that don't mix very well. Uh, presenting a talk on both heavy and sad socialism. It's a very grim, dark thing. Matt Bell talking about hell, sort of set that up for us. Uh, and then we've got to combine it with Moore's witty and wise, mirthful utopia. It's like serving a peanut butter sandwich mixed with pickled herring, uh, <laughs> or, or making a Netflix special featuring the art of laughter, or the joy of laughter and oral surgery. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or it's as if you dressed up for Halloween as someone pretending to be you. <laughs> what? If you're puzzled at that sort of ironic and contradictory humor, where you thought it was going one way and it goes another, welcome to Thomas More's Utopia. It's a very puzzling book that gives you the distinct sense that you are not always in on the joke, at least not at first, but that the humor is, nevertheless, there to help the reader to more than just laughs. In other words, its ironic jokes are not very socialist, because, as we all know, socialist jokes are only funny if everybody gets it. <laughs> Wait for it? No. <laughs> In fact, Utopia is so puzzling that it's been famously nicknamed the Statesman's Puzzle. Yet the book is less and less puzzling the wittier and more ironically humorous a lens you use to read it. On the other hand, utopia is far more puzzling for people who have a bad case of Grundlichkeit, that ponderous seriousness that can't handle dialogue and double meaning. The great critic of socialism and communism, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, put it this way, 
no one would ever dare accuse Stalin of having a sense of humor. Right? <laughs> They're not known for their sense of humor. With 50 million dead, I suppose that joke is always sort of hashtag too soon, but it, it's, they're, they're dark, deep, serious, grim fellows. Uh, and Moore has even famously witty, uh, has, was even famously witty uh, in the hour of his death. Right? So here's a, the difference between Stone and Moore. Um, unlike the brutal, humorous, unfunny, socialist, communist Stalin, Again, I repeat myself, who murdered many millions? The Christian humanist, poet, lawyer, statesman uh, loved to laugh. He referred to himself as having the nature of half a jiglet and more. Uh, do you guys know what a jiglet is? It's, if you ever go to Italy or Mexico, the street vendors will carve these little wooden dentures. Uh, and the way you open them, they scrape and they get <laughs> So it's like a little like laughing denture. Like that's how Moore referred to himself in his books. It's like, I can't stop laughing even though I'm this very serious statesman. Please don't tickle my funny bone. Um, in his lifetime, Moore was famous for using humor both to mock his opponents, not always with sarcasm, mind you, but very often uh, also with witty irony that was difficult to defeat and that pricked the conscience. When Sir Moore rose to the national stage as Speaker of the House, he was known as Master Mock. And Moore was even famously witty, like I said, on the scaffold. Among other jests, when rising to the scaffold and the chopping block, he joked to his own headsman, I pray you, uh, let my, uh, me lay my beard over the block, lest you should cut it. The reason being, of course, that my beard has not offended the king. <laughs> it's a moment of death. Moore mentioned not a few times, by the way, uh, in his writings, that his, in his letters, that his last name in l both Latin and Greek means fool. And his first name, Didymus Thomas, means twin or double. Um, also, it means mulberry, but that's really neither here nor there. Um, after Moore's death, in the times that follow, he was honored by Shakespeare with a very favorable collaborative play called Sir Thomas More. You heard I did my dissertation on that play which Shakespeare co-wrote with five other popular pr playwrights of his day. So imagine if Spielberg, Nolan, um, you, you know, pick your, pick your uh, like top Lucas, big, big names, Whedon, uh, all got together and said, okay, we were gonna produce this play. The, the, um, the censors said, no, you may not, uh, because it had a riot scene and they didn't want anyone thinking about rioting in London. Um, but it was nevertheless a professionally produced or written play by some of the top playwrights. Um, Moore, uh, lost my place here. In it, true to biographical accounts, Moore is completely serious when he must be. Quelling a citywide riot in London and administering justice for the realm of the Privy Council of the King, but otherwise, he's constantly dropping witty mocks, funny puns, and clever and ironic jokes for his friends, Desiderius Erasmus, uh, and even, very subtly, for his friend, King Henry VIII, always with an eye to both their delight and their instruction. Moore even stages a humble little morality play within the play for his friend, the Lord Mayor of London, called The Marriage of Wit and Wisdom. Indeed, throughout the play, Moore jests in this witty, wise way, staging humorous plays of his own that contain high moral matter. For instance, when imprisoned in the tower on the eve of execution, he tells the guard a low potty humor joke that has a high and subtle lesson about tyranny, meant explicitly for the king, should he ever hear tell of it, which Moore rightly suspects he will. As the tower guard character puts it marveling aloud in the play, in life and death, still marry Sir Thomas More. In other words, the author of Utopia knew how to laugh, how to mock, how to jest, how to speak doubly and ironically, even when discussing serious life and death matters of political justice. I've got a little spider here. Hello, friend. <laughs> it's a comic prop. Uh, life and death questions like justice and tyranny. He knew how to both uh, love and mock himself, his friends, and his king. And by the way, if, as I will argue here, Moore was a proto-Republican that wanted to see England move from a monarchy to a full-blown republic, um, 
you'd better learn how to make fun of a king without getting your head cut off, right? How else do you do it short of murdering your fellow citizens? But you wouldn't know Moore's utopia holds up socialists for ambivalent scrutiny, ironic mockery, and subtle correction if you insist on witlessly viewing the world through the lens of unironic, literal-minded, stripped-down, unadorned socialist Grundlichkeit. For example, if you took a chilly turn through the Alexandrovsky Garden in the Kremlin in Moscow, you will find a monument, an ornate obelisk, commemorating the Romanov czars of yesteryear. With carved granite, tens of feet tall, and shining gold-leafed double eagle pyramidian cap, the obelisk feels very czarist, very ornate, like those potentates that share both in sort of the East and the West that, you, that ruled Russia for hundreds of years. And yet, it was only erected in 2013, or rather, it was restored by Putin. Lenin erased the original, ordering Soviet riflemen literally to shoot off the original commemorative texts in his 1918 campaign of Soviet propaganda, shortly after the Bolshevik Revolution. Lenin placed, or replaced the old Tsarist monument, or really just defaced it, with the brutalist and ponderously named Monument Obelisk to Outstanding Thinkers and Personalities of the Struggle for the Liberation of Workers. No gold leaf on the Soviet monument, no double eagle, just a single heavy cold stone. I just got bit by a spider. <laughs> That's right, no, it's, it's a drone from AOC. <laughs> the Soviet obelisk was simply a list. The Soviets like keeping lists commemorating revolutionary thinkers and activists that paved the way for the Bolsheviks' moment of triumph and the new socialist era of glorious transition to full communism for the USSR, which stands for, lest we forget, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. In the precise middle of the vertical list of names below Karl Marx and our very thorough friend, Frederick Engels, and amidst French art anarchists and German socialist party leaders, Lenin and his Soviet propagandists saw fit to carve the name of Thomas More. No doubt on account of his famous and famously misread book, Utopia, and its fictitious island, which has abolished private property and is said to have neither poverty, nor envy, nor strife. Now this stark obelisk, like so much of Soviet propaganda, is a lie. And like the rest of so the Soviet Empire's House of Lies, the obelisk was bulldozed unceremoniously after communism's fall. But the lie of Moore's utopia that it's socialist still stands. If one thoughtlessly skims utopia or willfully cherry picks from its lengthy and ironic dialogue, it's possible to think the author advocates socialism and the abolition of private property. After all, Raphael Hithliday, the dubious traveler in the dialogue, whom Moore compares to the famous liar Odysseus, does offer the following lengthy speech. This is Raphael Hithliday speaking at length, Grundlichkeit. The most prudent man, that is Plato, in his republic easily foresaw that there could be only one way to public well-being by decreeing the equality of possessions, which I do not think could ever be observed when individuals have private ownership. For when each person by a definite right and title, remember that, sweeps up as much as can be uh, to himself, the entire supply of goods, no matter how large, is divided up among only a few persons, leaving scarcity for everyone else. It generally happens then that each group really deserves the destiny of the other group, since the few are rapacious, shameless, and useless, while the many, by contrast, are modest and simple, and by their daily industry, more kindly disposed to the public interest than they are to themselves. And this is why I am fully persuaded that goods cannot be distributed in an equitable or just way, or that anything can turn out well in human affairs, unless ownership is completely abolished. And on the other hand, as long as it remains, so also will remain an anxiety-producing and inescapable load of hardships and poverty for the largest part, and the best part by far of the human race. Whew. Okay, long quote, straight up socialism. But to think that this is Moore's position, 
or that it is the final verdict of the dialogue of utopia, would be like witlessly cherry-picking Macbeth's Act V despair speech, including that, concluding that Shakespeare and the entire tragedy of Macbeth agree with the character Macbeth when he says that life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Perhaps Macbeth had read too many socialist pamphlets that day. Would the socialist interpretation of Moore's subtle and dialogic text uh, work more, uh, less careless and more, dare I say it, thorough, we wouldn't be in this position. It is perhaps more than simply an amusing irony then that the character of Raphael Hithloday loves overwhelming his interlocutors with very thorough, very lengthy monologues, not unlike Frederick Engels and his fellow socialist, Dr. E. During. Those who think so simply and simplistically as to suggest seriously and literally that we ought to remove all private property to solve our political ills are the same sorts that can't, for lack of wit, follow a dialogue and can't engage in one either. Like Syndrome from Brad Bird's Incredibles, they're too busy monologuing. Literary wit, listening, conversing, discerning, seeing double meaning, irony, humor, paradox, the habit of looking at life, at human behavior, or at the city, and realizing that what's before your eyes is a tale told by no idiot, which signifies much more than nothing. But that's the position of atheist materialism that undergirds socialism, is there's nothing but meat in front of you. You don't have to have a double vision. You don't see the providence of God. You don't see an immortal soul. You don't see mind, principle, spirit. You just see meat on a rock hurtling through the dark. It's a very monologic way of thinking about the world. Okay, that was pretty ponderous. <laughs> so these ponderous and thorough monologuers, masters of Grundlichkeit, tend to lack the subtlety and receptivity, that is, the wit required for wisdom, for good judgment about what people say, about texts that people write, and about the cities and societies that we need to build. That is, the socialist character type which Moore lampoons in the person of Raphael Hithloday in Utopia tends to have Grundlichkeit when expounding their own theories of utopian and scientific socialism, but also tend to lack that same thoroughness when it comes to being attentive to reality itself and what other people are telling them. And that reality is that Moore's character in Utopia strongly objects to Raphael Hithloday's socialist institutions, both in book one and in book two of Utopia. Here's Moore's objection from book one that he had to wait to give because Raphael Hithloday went on and on for a long time before he could finally get a word in edgewise in the dialogue. <clears throat> but on the contrary, Moore said, it seems to me that life can never be lived with any convenience where all things are owned in common. For how could there be a good supply of things with everybody trying to get out of work, not being urged by the profit motive and becoming lazy by relying on the work of others? But even if they are spurred to work by the scarcity, when nobody is able lawfully to protect as his own what he has acquired, is it not inevitable that everyone will suffer from perpetual murder and sedition, especially when the authority and reverence of magistrates is gone, for how there could be any place for that when the people cannot be distinguished among themselves in any way, I cannot imagine. And yet, despite this very clear counterargument and others from Thomas More, the character in his own dialogue, the bogus claim that More's utopia is really a work of socialist and communist theory is still proudly trumpeted, both from on high in the ivory tower, for instance, Cambridge University's Terry Eagleton, and from on low in the digital swamps of Wikipedia on the surprise, surprise entry for utopian socialism. Now to be fair, it may be that utopia is considered a socialist book because at least some socialists, trained as they are for straightforward scientific accounts of political economy and radical revolution, cannot read a text for metaphor and irony. Being able to read for subtlety takes a good deal of liberal arts training like the kind we offer here at Hillsdale. Perhaps it's as simple as to say they are just too literal-minded, lacking a literary education in true wit. 
Or maybe they're just mentally drained from all the pamphleteering. <laughs> maybe. I tend to think that gets them excited for some reason. Being able to read for subtlety, right, that skill, not being there, right, maybe it's just uh, that they actually don't, th they have subtlety, but they actually refuse to read for subtlety in a way that takes Utopia's ironic and mocking presentation of their own position seriously because they're more interested in the political project of socialism than being truthful about what other people have said. That is, they don't mind lying to you. That was Solzhenitsyn's big point in the Gulag Archipelago. Right? Remember Professor John Grant, uh, the head of the politics department here, came out to Kirby uh, a few years back. Some of the lie, just they will lie, they want to hold the lie. Uh, and, and Solzhenitsyn was like, you got to speak the truth. Or perhaps they simply can't bear to be mocked, so they just block out the subtle reasoning. Maybe it's subconscious. Another possible obstacle to reading Utopia wittily is that most socialists think too little about politics and think much more narrowly about economic questions concerning the means of production. They tend to deride political and constitutional fixes as merely bourgeois institutions, half measures to be pitied, that must be swept away by the revolution as soon as possible. That means they do not consider rightly nor respect the fact that Thomas More is in fact a proto-Republican. He's a proto-Republican thinker. That is, Moore's ironic criticism of private property in the voice of Raphael Hithliday is not the radical attacks of socialists on a widely distributed and legally held democratic system of private property, generosity, and equality like we have or strive to have here in the US. Rather, Moore's teachings on private property are attempting to moderate the radically oligarchic position of the landed aristocracy of England. I'm reminded of one of my teachers, another Hillsdale professor, Dr. Tom West, when he would lament the lockup of federal lands by the US Senate and the Department of Interior that couldn't be accessed for private property ownership by the citizenry. Instead, imagine this, Moore was looking at an unelected Senate, namely the House of Lords, the members of which personally own the land and have permanent claim to it in perpetuity for their descendants forever and ever, amen. It's not surprising that radical socialists can't see Moore's attempt to moderate the claims of property ownership so that property could be treated in a way more in line with common sense and natural reason, changing the laws to something closer to what we have now. But socialists probably do see, at least, that Moore is honoring admirable qualities of at least some socialists and some or some accounts of what we might call soft socialism. For instance, detachment from material goods. Right? We should be detached, right? We can't take it with us. You don't want your things to own you. You want to own your things. That's very admirable, right? Love of the poor, that's very good. See Jesus. And yes, ridicule, ridicule for the folly-filled idea that you and your family have a given plot of land by nature. In other words, the ideology behind landed aristocracy, which we Americans expressly forbid in our Constitution, in part because of the witty proto-Republican councils of writers like Moore. But socialists don't see these subtle dynamics in utopia because those ir ironies um, detail uh, and serve the purpose of weakening the claims of nobility and encouraging the civic spiritedness and of generosity and friendship. And a proper, witty, and accurate reading of utopia does not support the socialist historical narratives nor their radical policy to abolish all or most private property for the sake of socialist control of the means of production. Socialists seem not to suspect Moore's strong yet subtle mockery of their very dangerous intellectual vices, their love of monologues, of having their way, of living like kings and their opinions, unhampered by the messy details of actual political reality. It's true that Moore respects the socialist character type, Raphael Hithliday's first name does mean healer of God. Just so the socialist character type as an admirably ardent desire for perfection, right, that's commendable, is worth praising. For society where no one suffers, never gonna happen, but obviously it's something that theoretically you would like to see. We're all hoping for heaven, for something like that, right, where every tear shall be wiped away. 
Uh, and where Ingalls, or as Ingalls put it, where everyone holds, quote, the common property of all to be worked for the common good of all, or as Matt Bell was quoting earlier, right, heaven, but you don't even need it. Right? It all sounds nice. It sounds lovely. Socialism does sound good. Witty Sir Thomas More was aware of just how lovely socialism sounded, but just as it takes a certain sharp-sided wit to see when an offer is too good to be true, likewise, I just saw a billboard driving from the Detroit airport today, free college. We just, that was all the billboard said in some address. You're like, probably not. Right? <laughs> Something's up. Right? Hold on to your wallet. Uh, likewise, More sees uh, in utopia to train our own, seeks in utopia to train our own wit to see the difference between a political order that sounds good and one that actually looks good in reality, one that is good and not just good in theory. That's why the proto-socialist character of Raphael Hitlerday isn't just God's healer, nor simply a skilled speaker in nonsense. He has both names together because nothing that is is all bad, nor in this world at least, all good in all respects at all times. This sort of double vision, this ability to see something admirable in socialist impulses while also realizing the dangerous and tyrannical, deeply tyrannical impulses that lurk beneath them, this sort of witty wise habit of looking at life and politics to see what it is, what you wish it could be, and the difference between prudential political improvements and radically dangerous, dangerously radical, thoroughly stupid, and stupidly thorough political change is revealed in Utopia as the difference between dialogue and monologue, between Moore and Hifliday, and between what we might call Republican wit and tyrannical and socialist Grundlichkeit. And Moore's Utopia, centuries before the full flowering of socialism and communism, offers a deep meditation on prudential politics and a powerful and witty critique of such thoroughgoing tyrannies, the sort that is enslaved to a witless idea of perfection and to the sound of their own monologic voices. At the close of Utopia, after a long tale from Hitlerday full of ironic and conflicting statements designed to help the reader think about politics and justice, Moore's own character thinks that the laws and customs of the Utopians seem very absurdly established, but he says, most of all in their, that feature which is the principal foundation of their whole structure. I mean their common life and subsistence without any exchange of money. Utopia's lack of customs and laws protecting private property and commerce, more emphasizes, quote, utterly overthrows all the nobility, taking from the nobles, right, that word, if you take away private property of all the people, of the commonwealth, the commons, you overthrow, utterly overthrow all the nobility, magnificence, that's a kingly term, splendor, another kingly, and majesty, another kingly term, which are, in the estimation of the common people, the true glories and ornaments of the commonwealth. The Latin here is more telling, and forgive me, Ut publica est opinio decora atque ornamenta re publica, or re publicae. Thomas More is carefully, wittily, and subtly a champion of democratic republicanism in an age of monarchs and monologues. A writer responsible for a masterwork of Western literature full of Socratic irony designed to educate a free people for personal virtue and self-government by means of a city in speech like that of Plato's in the Republic, or more like Cicero's in the De Republica. It was this man, Thomas More, whom Lenin, in one of history's monumental ironies, deigned to call comrade. I imagine that the wily and witty Sir Thomas More, the statesman who Shakespeare tells us loved to be merry, would have received this honor if he were alive today with a wry smile and his trademark irony. He might have said something like this, thank you, comrades. I had thought that the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics would have better left me out in the cold, but you have honored me in a way no good man should ever hope for. Mm -hmm. 
You can make those kinds of jokes all day if you read Utopia as many times as I have. That's what it's designed to do. Make a, uh, fashion your wit, shape your wit. Now, I'll stop monologuing and start dialoguing with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meehan. We now have time for Q&A. Please make your way to the microphone if you have a question. I just have a short question. I can't give the microphone, but uh, I understand that Utopia was written in Latin. That's right. And is it able to be read in English? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's uh, a number of translations. Uh, there's ones free online. There's uh, a really excellent translation is actually coming out uh, from the essential works of Thomas More uh, this January, which was uh, put together over the course of 20 years uh, with a professor, uh, Jerry Wegemer, who I studied with, but also uh, his co-editor uh, is S Dr. Stephen Smith here at... Uh, uh, Hillsdale. So it's it's actually that book's coming out in January with all the best translation, the best notes that really explain what is going on in this text and all of Moore's major texts. That's coming in January. And for a, uh, a mind of this caliber who's written this many classics and has had this much influence, this happens once every hundred years. So uh, that's something to pay attention to in January. But that's the best translation. I've seen it. I've heckled over some of its footnotes with Steve a couple times, but uh, that's coming out in January. Yes, please. If I think of Mark Nagel's... Uh, you got a microphone, sir? Please make your way to the microphone if you have a question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the long walk. <laughs> we'll take one while he's getting there, please. Thank you for your talk today. Um, I remember, you know, I'm getting to the point in my life where I'm thinking, long ago when the dinosaurs were young, I used to tell my daughter. Uh, I remember our, and this is more of a current cultural thing, but I think it's tangentially related to Thomas More, that we had, we had a richness of, of comedy in our, in our culture, uh, from, from broad slapstick to, to incisive intellectual wit. And it seems like today there's no humor because the socialists have taken over the mechanisms of comedy and through this PC nonsense, which is nothing more than an intellectual and a humor uh, straitjacket, is, you know, comedy's not funny. It's either scatological or it's, it's just dreadfully morbid and dull and malicious. I just want to comment, you know, from, a, from Thomas More to this. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I, there are comics, I think oftentimes uh, some really excellent wit is wasted on scatological material. Some brilliant people who decide to go hide in some filth that is sort of not really oh, fit for dignified enjoyment, right? So there's that problem. I think there is still wit out there, it's oftentimes uh, submerged in some filth, but um, you do see some rebellion, right? There is, and the comics and the comedians are sort of fighting back. Even the director of the latest Joker movie, in protest, Joker is actually a silent Grundlichkeit type film. It's this ponderous, dark, brooding thing. He's a he's a comic director, uh, but he said, "I can't do comedy for now, so you're just going to have to deal with that." Almost like a protest, a sort of laughter strike. Uh, so I don't know if the clowns are going to save us, but uh, there is sort of a, some tomfoolery that's uh, gaining steam, I think. Yes, if I think of uh, the inspiration for Marx and Engels, uh, communism coming from the sweatshops of England in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, where does uh, Thomas More get his inspiration from for writing about socialism the way he did? Question. Um, so the enclosure movement is actually featured and discussed in book one uh, of the dialogue. And uh, for 
for him, he's very upset with the nobility making property right claims, uh, evicting uh, peasants who've lived in the same family home for a thousand years. But because it wasn't on a piece of paper and it wasn't enforced by the House of Law, Lords, the, the common people's common wealth, their property, their homes, were judged worthless. So that gets him thinking about uh, radical claims to property ownership uh, of the lords. So he's taking aim at the lords who've kicked all these people off to, in order to make sheepfolds. Uh, but what's happened is they've lost their homes, so they can't farm, uh, and they wind up taking to the streets, turning to crime, and hangings are like spike thousands of percent, like it's just a, a bloodbath every day, they're hanging people. So Moore's responding to that. But if you don't pay attention, you go, oh, look, he's, he's mad at private property. So, no, he, he loves private property. He thinks it's been violated by the nobility. A specious private property claim of the elite has robbed all of the peasants of their commonly held homes for a thousand years. Yeah. So I've not read uh, the uh, Utopia yet uh, or Plato's Republic. Uh, I've just begun reading the Gulag Archipelago, but I have read uh, quite a majority of Plato's Timaeus and Critias, which tells the story of Atlantis, which is, the, I mean, the usual story we've all heard some version of is that it was a uh, utopia-type paradise that fell because it turned to uh, decadence and just filth and was of course, uh, destroyed in uh, tsunami or, or flood. That's the very end of the story. But the also the the more moral, I guess, and social aspect or lesson of the story was that a utopia in the paradise sense, at least if you're talking about a government or a socialism, uh, either one of any sort is that it's ultimately unattainable and uncreatable because it falls apart and is uh, badly managed so much that there's nothing you can do with it. And that, that so the question is, so in this, so in this way, are there two stories of, uh, of Atlantis and Utopia? Is, is that, a, am I accurate about the similarity and what seems to be the goal of socialism is when you ask the socialists, they have no vision. So what is their coherent plan? And are the, I mean, is that a correct similarity? That was a lot of Grudlichkeit for an awesome question. <laughs> uh, the, you're, you're absolutely right to see Critias, the, right, he says, I've got this place I'm going to tell you about that seems very strange, but every word of it's true. So it's very much Raphael Hifflede. I swear no place exists. Utopia exists. Sure, buddy. Right? He's a traveler. It's kind of sketchy. Um, and he also says it was his 90-year-old uh, grandfather who told it to him when he was eight. So they're like, what? Really? You're going to have a detailed political program from that exchange? So it's, it's that same kind of dubious, I've got a perfect ideal that's very questionable. Um, so yeah, I think Moore's definitely, he translated Plato's Republic, I think, twice, and definitely read a number of his dialogues, to try to think deeply about constitutionalism, politics, Republican government, um, and utopia is in part a product of a very sustained study of his own, uh, of Plato. So you're totally right there. That's a good catch, and you're, you're spot on. What do they want? I think Moore's got their number in Raphael Hithliday. What he really wants is everyone to praise him, everyone to say you're a genius, everyone to more or less put him up, pay for him, right? And say, yeah, this guy's brilliant. He's got a great plan. Hopefully one day we can do it, but you know, let's give him some power. Let's have him rule. Libido dominandi, the desire to dominate other people, right? Gnosticism, I've got a secret teaching it's really hard to explain and you don't understand. It's science, it's history, it's complicated. It's, just give me all your property, please. <laughs> yeah. 
I really think it gets down to those kinds of simple, really dangerous desires, but they're under a giant, just smoke screen, yes, of, of but, but pink smoke and green smoke and glitter and bombs. It's, and, and then they fall for the image. No, I'm really doing this good thing. So that's... I'll ask you a simple question. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you think uh, socialism has ever been achieved? It sounds to me it's a fantasy and remains a fantasy as far as any advanced society. Do I think it's ever been achieved? Correct. No. No. I mean, if, if, if achievement is a, a one-minute sentiment of a number of people with a document in a room, then sure, I'm sure it's been achieved a, a number of times, but no, we've never had a working state that's actually been socialistic in the promise. It's always been an apparent socialism, right? Which is, that's the kind of double vision you need. Oh, please. I agree with you because what happens, there's always a small number controlling a massive number, whether it's a monarchy or, or whatever, it seems to come down to that and socialism is another variety of that. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. All right.